Good day, grade tens. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. In this lesson, we're going to be going through chemical bonding. But before we do that, I'd like to remind you that um, you can easily, easily join our class. Just go onto the Turnable website and join our class. And that way you can actually ask us questions and you can ask me questions, you can message me. If I don't see the message during the lesson, then I will actually see it after the lesson. And you can also not only ask me questions, but if there's a section that you're really struggling on in grade 10 uh, physics or chemistry, then you can ask me and I will plan a lesson around that. Right, so now let's continue with chemical bonding. So there are three types of bonding which you should know about already, but let's go through it nice and slowly. There are covalent bonds, ionic bonds, metallic bonds. Okay, there are three types, covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and metallic bonds. And what is very important for you guys to notice, because we're going to be covering, covering the other type in a minute, well, not in a minute, <laughs> in the next couple of lessons, is that these are called intra molecular bonds intra because they're within the molecules okay you guys know about the internet right the internet is called that because it's a network that joins a whole bunch of different computers across the world wide web now there is also a thing called the intranet which you probably may have heard of and that's like for example if you have a network within your school or business within your school within the school or business, right? So you don't need to get out into the World Wide Web to be able to message your buddy, okay, if you're on the internet. But if, for example, I live in South Africa and I want to message my friend Ruth who lives in Germany, then I cannot use my intranet unless we're working for the same company. I have to use the internet. So internet is between okay and intra is within now these bonds that we're talking about here are within the molecule okay and they are called the intramolecular bonds and the reason i'm mentioning this is because in a couple of lessons we're going to talk about the intermolecular bonds and forces and i find that most of my students get very very confused about that so i like to highlight it straight away so that you guys can get used to this so this is how atoms bond to form molecules this is how atoms bond to form molecules okay this is how they bond to form molecules right now Let's talk a little bit more about the different types of bonds that you get. The first type is covalent bonding. Now, they don't come in all, it doesn't matter which order we do it in as long as we do them, right? So covalent bonding, this is where electrons are shared and it's usually between non-metals. And I am gonna go into more detail with each of these bonding models. I'm just giving you a general overview to remind you of stuff you should actually know by now. So covalent bonding is where electrons are shared okay and mostly between your non-metals and they often are diatomic molecules now what is a diatomic molecule a diatomic molecule well, the name kind of gives you the idea okay di means two and atomic means two atoms okay so diatomic molecules are basically molecules made up of two identical oopsie identical atoms note i'm trying to write a bit neater now two identical atoms so on your periodic table there is what there's hydrogen there is oxygen there's nitrogen and then are all the halogens all the halogens form diatomic molecules and they are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, which you don't have to worry about. So those there are your diatomic molecules. So those are all, I can guarantee you straight off that those are going to be covalently bonded, okay? And we'll talk about how we know that later. So these are covalently bonded. They're because and also they are diatomic molecules so that means in nature 
they appear as diatomic molecules. You don't generally find an oxygen atom floating freely or whatever. Okay, moving on, ionic bonding. Yeah, electrons are transferred. So yeah, the electrons are shared. Yeah, they are transferred from one atom to another. And usually this is between metals and non-metals. Now, grade 10s, I'm a little bit nervous about you guys learning that this is mostly between non-metals and this is mostly between metals and non-metals because they are actual examples where this doesn't actually hold okay so it is better for you guys to learn the actual definition which is that covalent bonding is where electrons are shared and ionic bonding is where electrons are transferred if you know nothing about the how they strongly they hold on to the electrons and you are looking at the periodic table and you recognize that both atoms are non-metals then yes you can guess that it's covalent bonding or if you can see that one atom is a metal and the other one's a non-metal then yes you can guess that it's ionic bonding but and that would be an educated guess in both cases but it's not always a guarantee there are part there are places where this doesn't hold so i'm a little bit nervous for you guys just to learn that as general definition for covalent bonding so be careful of that okay now with ionic bonding Positive and negative ions are formed. And why is that? Well, if we're transferring electrons, say we've got an atom A and it gives away an electron to something, then do you agree it becomes positively charged? Because an electron is negatively charged when your atom, this is neutral, this is a neutral atom, and when it gives away an electron, it becomes a positive ion why because it's got one less electron in it and that is called a cat ion a cation is a positive ion similarly if we've got some random element b which then accepts the electron okay so it would be an atom that would accept that electron so it's going to be b minus plus the electron so this time it accepted that electron Okay, let me draw it another way just in case you're getting a bit confused by this. Let me draw it another way. It doesn't really matter how you draw it as long as you're getting it right. So let's do it like this. Let's say that A is becoming A plus and giving it away electron. And that electron is traveling along and it joins up with B to become a negative ion so b becomes a negative ion by accepting that electron so it becomes a negative ion and negative ions are called anions ion ions and later in this lesson we're going to talk about how we know whether the atom is going to give away an electron or take it up or if that's even going to happen or if it's covalent bonding and it's all to do with electronegativity Okay, electronegativity. So guys, it's quite late in the year already. So this should be a revision lesson for you if you've already been doing your, done your chemical bonding. If you haven't, if your teacher's chosen to teach you this in a different order, no big deal. So you'll be learning stuff. But if this is a revision le lesson and you're finding that you're not remembering some of the stuff, then I suggest that you go and study it and then go onto the Turnable platform because the cool thing about the platform is that there's lots of uh, multiple choice questions, there's exam questions, there's ex actually more videos on this type of stuff and it gives you all the information you need. So you can do some good revision on this, which will be great. Okay. Let's move on. Then there's metallic bonding, and that's within metals. And if you know anything about metallic bonding, you should know that there is this phrase, C of D localized electrons. And we will obviously be talking about metallic bonding later on as well. And I'll talk that, but this metallic bonding is with only within metals, and it's actually within the same metal within the same metal okay so there we go so it's covalent bonding ionic bonding and metallic bonding right so before we even talk about these 
bonding models, we need to talk about the Lewis dot diagrams. And why is that? Because this is a way to show how atoms bond to form compounds. So it's just a way for us to represent it. Okay, and it's easier to understand how things bond if you understand how the Lewis dot diagrams work. So it says we use dots or crosses to represent the valence electrons of the atoms. So let's talk about what the valence electrons are. The valence electrons are what? They are the number of electrons in the outer energy level, okay? And we can find out the number of valence electrons from the group number, okay? So if you guys have been watching my lessons, you'll have noticed that I've gone, I always go one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight okay because over here which is not shown over here so i just want to get rid of that um i'm sorry my software doesn't allow for straight lines which is very frustrating but over here well it doesn't add for rulers i think i must change software anyway over here that is where the transition elements normally fit this is where the transition elements or metals, elements or metals fit, okay? But you guys don't really need to know much about the transition elements or metals. Um, I will teach you in a later lesson exactly what you do need to know about them. But they're called transition elements metals because their number of valence electrons change. Electrons can change, okay? which means their charge can change. In fact, the only one that doesn't change is silver. Silver is always Ag+, plus, okay? But some of the others will be, for example, zinc, two, sorry, I don't know why my thing's just doing this all of a sudden. Okay, zinc, two plus, or it could be zinc, three plus, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So everything in the transition metals, we ignore at the moment, okay? We're just talking about the valence electrons in the rest of the periodic table. So the periodic table goes one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And those group numbers tell us the number of valence electrons. So why is this helpful? Because the valence electrons, remember that everything wants to bond to basically have a complete energy shell, okay? So except for period one, period one only wants, oh, we're missing helium. I wonder what happened to helium. Let me just write it in. Look, here's helium, helium. Okay, and helium's like that, okay. So except for period one, okay, which has got two electrons in its outer energy shell. Everything else, all the others have got eight, okay? And that brings us to the octet rule, which we'll talk about in a second, okay? So what happens is the reason that atoms bond is to try and become like these noble gases, noble gases. And they become want to become like the noble gases because their outer energy levels are full, which means they do not, do not need to react with energy. It also means that they're at their lowest energy state. You must remember that everything, everything, everything bonds to try and get to a lower energy state. Okay, it wants to be lazy. It wants to have least amount of energy. So that is why it bonds. So now, why are these valence electrons important? Well, hydrogen in this group here, we're seeing that we've got one valence electron. Yeah, we've got two. Yeah, we've got three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the fact that if this also tells us how many bonds it can make. Okay, so there's a difference between valence electrons and valency. Running out of space. Valency. Let me get a different color. 
valency is the number of bonds that you can make, okay? And the way you count your valency is one, two, three, four, three, two, one, zero, okay? This one has got, if you think about lithium, okay, lithium is going to give away its electron or share this electron with but it's just share this one electron. So it becomes like a noble gas. Beryllium are gonna share these two. Boron are gonna share these three. Carbon are gonna share those four. Now, when you get to groups five, six, and seven, do you see there's a space over here and a space over here and a space over there? So if nitrogen can find other electrons to share or to be donated to it, then it will have gained three electrons by bonding, making three bonds, okay? Oxygen has a space here. Oh, sorry. Oxygen has a space there and a space there. So it can gain, have two bonds, right? Because that's a bond and that's a bond. It's going to have two bonds and it's either going to, depending if it's ionic, if it's ionic, it's going to take two electrons from somebody. If it's covalent, it's going to share those electrons with somebody to, to basically form two bonds there and become like a noble gas. Fluorine only has one little space here. Okay, that's where that number comes from. We can either again ionically bond by taking up an electron or covalently bond by sharing an electron to become noble. Okay, so like I said, this lithium okay, is going to share that one electron. Beryllium is going to share two. Boron is going to share three. Carbon, ditto. Then nitrogen, it looks at the spaces. How can we get it? Okay, right, but we will speak more about that as we go through the different types of bonding as well. So like I said to you, the forming of the compounds with the atoms gain, lose, or share electrons to give a stable electron configuration is characterized by the eight valence electrons. This is obviously except for period, period one, okay? Period one has only got two valence electrons, which is your hydrogen and your helium, remember? Your helium's got two and hydrogen's trying to become like helium. So if you look at fluorine, for example, fluorine is in group seven. Let's go back. Fluorine's in group seven. So it has got seven valence electrons. So what happens is you will find that you've got one, I'm gonna cross this here, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then there's seven electrons coming from the second fluorine atom to make your actual diatomic molecule of F2. Now, there is something wrong with this original picture, okay, and what is that? So if you guys have done Lewis dot notation, you will know what's wrong with this picture. What's wrong with this picture is that it's all dots. And that means that we can't tell which electrons belong to which atom. And when we are showing bonding, we have to, have to, have to be able to work out which electrons come from which atom. So the correct way to do this would be to show it differently. So I don't mind if you use dots and crosses or dots and circles. I personally prefer dots and crosses because it's very difficult. Sometimes your circles look like dots. Okay, if say now if you're doing this, Sometimes that circle, if you're doing it quickly, can actually look like a dot and vice versa. So the better thing to do would be to use dots and crosses. So how does this work? Fluorine is in group seven, so it's got seven valence electrons. So it works like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And do you see there's a gap here? There's a gap. These are un these are unshared pairs of electrons, okay? They don't need anybody. This is a lone, it's just, by, sorry, these are called lone pairs, lone pairs, or unpaired shares of electrons. They are, belong strictly to fluorine, okay? Then we have another fluorine comes along. Here we go. And this becomes one, oops, no dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
okay and what's going to happen is this dude is going to move in there okay so it ends up looking like this it's going to end up looking like this one two three four five six seven and then it's going to end up with a dot here and then obviously one two three four five six okay and you will notice that i drew them like this when i was drawing it and my first one specifically i did one two okay and then i did three four five six seven now why did i do it why didn't i do it like i did this one where i just went oh well it's one two three four five six seven because the first two that i draw represent the first two in the first energy level okay the 2s after that what is the rule the rule is that the electrons fill up from the bottom okay and they use the Pauli exclusion principle which says that you'll have one electron in each orbital and only if they have opposite spins so that is why what i'm doing is i'm going okay fine there's my first two that are filling up the s orbital and now i'm filling up filling up my p orbital so i'm going one two three four five and there's my space okay so there we can see that there is a p orbital that is empty okay does everybody understand that i hope you guys do so it says that the octet rule is most useful in cases involving covalent bonding of carbon nitrogen oxygen and fluorine okay which is why we gave the example of the fluorine okay so now let's talk about specific bonding so let's talk about covalent bonding so the easiest way to do this is actually to look at how do hydrogen and chlorine bond okay so how do hydrogen and chlorine bond so we know that there is going to be sharing of electrons because it's covalent bonding so it's sharing of your electrons hydrogen is in group one okay and chlorine is in group seven now it says determine the electron configuration of each of the bonding atoms okay so we can do that hydrogen is what it is just going to be one s one do you agree it's in the first energy level it's in the s orbitals remember these are the s orbitals and these are the p orbitals and these are the T d orbitals but they're the transition elements so we don't really care about them at the moment okay so hydrogen is 1s1 let's talk about chlorine chlorine is going to be what it is going to be 1s2 it's got all the electrons in the first energy level then it's got 2s2 all the electrons in the second energy level the first part of the orbital 2p6 that is all full then 3s2 to dish to dish and then 1 2 3 4 5 3p5 so there we've got the electron configuration of each of the bonding atoms okay right now it says determining how many electrons are unpaired or paired okay so we could think about we know for a fact that your hydrogen has got one electron in it in this outer energy shell okay 3s2 3p5 let's just think about that if we had to draw this using our f bar diagrams okay do you agree this is 3s2 and this is 3p5 okay now by the way this is kind of the long way around to do it i'm showing you the long way around because I want you guys to understand where we get our information from. In the next example, I will do a much shorter version, or one or two of the examples from now. I'll do a much shorter version, and you can see the, how to get this faster, okay? But I need for you guys to understand where the information is coming from, because if you understand, then you won't forget, okay? So we've got 3s2, so it's going to be 1, 2, then 3p5. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, five so do you see that there is a gap here with a chlorine so we've got two pairs or one two three three pairs in our last energy level we've got three pairs of electrons okay that are lone pairs and one 
un, one, going to be one shared pair of electrons is this one. This is an unpaired electron, right? So now we have to work out how the electrons are shared. So let's draw a little Lewis dot notation. Our hydrogen has got a dot, it's just one. Our chlorine, we only draw in the valence electrons, which is this lot, okay? So we're going to go one, two, and then how many do we have? We've got another five, so it's seven, right? Three, four, five, six, seven. So do you see there's a gap here and a gap here? So they got a prettier picture than I have. So there you go. You've got one hydrogen, okay, one hydrogen here with a dot. There is your chlorine. And no, you don't have to draw the circles. I was effectively drawing the Lewis dots without the circles. And then what happens is they move in together so that this is a shared pair of electrons, right? Sorry. And that is how they were joined. So you'd actually write that as H plus Cl gives you H Cl. And there you go. Nice and easy, eh? Actually, what happens is it's two and two and a two. Because this in nature is a diatomic molecule. Chlorine is a diatomic molecule in nature. So it forms hydrogen chloride, but because they had to break up, we need to balance and put a big two in front of it. Okay, but that is how they bond. All right, let's have a look at another example. So we've given you the answer over here, but let's work and see how we get to this, okay? It says, how do nitrogen and hydrogen bond to form a molecule of ammonia, which is NH3? And that might be your exam or test question, okay? So let's have a look at it. First, we get the we again look for the electron configuration, electron configuration. So hydrogen is again just going to be 1s1. Nitrogen is over here. Okay. So nitrogen is what? It's 1s2 because it's in the full inner energy level. And then it's in the second energy level. It's got 2s2 and then 2p what? 1, 2, 3. 2p3. Okay, um, but please note, what group is this in? Nitrogen is in group 5, and do you see that this 2 plus 3 gives you 5? Similarly, if you look over here, chlorine is in group 7, and if you count, 2 plus 5 gives me 7. So again, like we've said before, the group number gives us the number of valence electrons. Okay, so we've got this. Now we need to work out the valence electrons. Well, this is really easy. Hydrogen's just got one. Then we've got to now look at our nitrogen. And again, if you want to, you could actually draw this out into 2s and 2p. So your s orbitals have got two. Okay, your p orbitals, each of them has got one. Each of them has got one. Okay, so do you see that there are three valence electrons? So now we need to work out how the electrons are shared. So this is how we draw it. First of all, we've got one hydrogen. Then we've got a nitrogen and we count one, two, three, four, five. So do you see there's a space here and there's a space here and there's a space here to be filled up. So what happens is one hydrogen comes here one hydrogen is going to go over here and one hydrogen is going to go over there so we end up with ammonia and what you need to remember about this and this is very important is this is a three-dimensional object so what actually happens is here is your nitrogen there is a hydrogen sticking out on the left hand side here there's a hydrogen sticking out on the right and there is a hydrogen at the back sticking out. It's kind of like a tripod, if you want to think of it like that. It's kind of like a tripod, okay? So it's coming out of the page with angles. Okay, so that would be the nitrogen, and these would be the three hydrogens, okay? So obviously, these aren't solid balls, and this isn't really a big stick there where the bond is. It's just to give you some idea of the fact that this is three-dimensional, okay? So think of a tripod. So the reason for those angles, which we will also cover later, is because of the number of lone pairs versus the number of shared pairs. Okay, but we'll talk about that in a future lesson. 
Right, so now let's talk about how oxygen atoms bond to form a diatomic molecule. So we've been going through these steps where I said first give the electronic configuration, electron configuration, we just did that. Then we said work out the number of valence electrons, which we did over here. Then we said, okay, now work out how the electrons are shared. So we draw the Lewis dot notation and we work out how they're shared. Okay, awesome. Now I'm going to show you the short way. Okay, so obviously I'd prefer it if you understood how to do this and you understood where it was coming from, but let's do oxygen. Okay, so we're talking about how do, how does this form, O2 form? Okay, so do you see that oxygen is in group, what is it in? It's in group six, which means it's got six valence electrons, right? We've said that already, it's got six valence electrons. So let's draw that. Okay, there's my oxygen. We've got one, two, Okay, then we've got three, four, five, and six. Okay. I don't like that my six is on that side. Let's just erase the six and do it over here. It really doesn't matter which way you go, by the way, whether you go clockwise or anticlockwise. So do you see we've got a gap here and we've got a gap here? Okay, right. If I did another oxygen, let's say that another oxygen, here it is, yeah. And I did this, and, but this, remember the orientation can move. Remember this is three dimensional and it's the orientation. So this time maybe my S orbital is on this side. So I've got one, two, and then I've got three, four, five, and six. Okay, so do you see there's a gap here and a gap here? Now imagine if that moved over here so that it fitted in over there so that there was a blue one and there was a blue one so that was that blue and that blue and then we'd be these two over here and over here and you'll see it is still a linear molecule because obviously it's two molecule two atoms so it has to be a linear bond but it is actually not please do not do this i hate this this is wrong please do not do that and then go um through three four, five, six, seven, eight, or whatever. Okay, no, hang on, it'll have to be six there. Um, erase. Let me fix it. Okay, so it can't be, be one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four. Do not do that. That does not show me how the electrons are actually shared. This here shows me that we've got two beautiful lone pairs and over there we've got two lone pairs. And then this one here is shared and this here is shared. Okay, so that gives me a much better idea of my shape. And these represent each represent a bond. So we end up with a double bond. So in fact, if we use Cooper notation, it is represented like this, O double bond. O. Okay, that's what that means. So every time we've got a shared pair of electrons, it is a bond this year. In case you didn't realize, it was a bond. Okay, right. So that is how we would use the shortcut. The shortcut is going straight to the group number, realizing that you've got so many valence electrons, drawing them in. And then obviously, there's another thing I needed to point out. Because I was using different colors, I used circles here and circles here. That's fine. But in exams, you guys will be drawing without colors, or you shouldn't be. So you should be doing something along the lines of one, two, three, four, five, and then just to make it easier for myself like that. And then you would do a circle, and you go circle, circle 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 right do you understand so you must use dots and crosses if you're using the same color if you happen to be using different colors then it doesn't matter as long as you can distinguish which electrons come from which atom right now let's move on let's look at another example let's look at carbon and fluorine so yeah we've got carbon and yeah we've got fluorine okay so carbon is in group four. So that means it must have four valence electrons. Okay. Fluorine is in group seven. So therefore it must have seven valence electrons. Now the reason I'm chosen this one is because it's special. Like 
I've said to you before, if we want to look at the number of electrons around nitrogen, okay, just let's have an example. Nitrogen is in group five, so it's got five valence electrons. So if I had to draw out the number of electrons around nitrogen using the dot method, um, the Lewis dot notation, I would go one, two, and then go three, four, five, right? And then I'd have a space here and a space here and a space here, right? Which helps us see that we've got a tripod shape. Great, awesome. Carbon, when it bonds covalently, because this is covalent bonding, with other atoms is special. What actually happens is one of the electrons actually gets excited and moves to a different um, to different orbital. Okay, so what ha actually happens is that, and you guys don't actually have to know this, I'm just explaining it to you to understand what the hell is going on, or what's going on. If normally with carbon, okay, let's just write down the SPD of notation. Carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, right? So if I had to draw this, normally it would look like this. It would be um, 2s would be one, two, and then two P would be one, two, and that's it. Okay, awesome. So you would expect carbon to be one, two, and then one, two. That's what you'd expect. But when carbon bonds, something very special happens. One of these S electrons in the S orbital gets very excited and it moves up to a P orbital. And what that means is that when we draw our carbon, we actually draw it with one electron on each of the sides to show that it is in each of the orbitals, okay? So one of these electrons gets excited, moves into the p orbital, okay? We still write it like this if we ask to draw the SPD of notation of carbon, but we need to understand that to be able to understand that carbon is special and it's the only one where we don't draw the little two S's by themselves because of the fact that when carbon bonds, this electron here jumps up into the p orbital. Okay, so in that case, we've got carbon right, which has got four valence electrons that are equally distributed around the carbon. Now we have fluorine. Now fluorine is in group seven, which means it's got seven valence electrons, right? So we're drawing fluorine like normal. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So do you see it has space to share with one electron to complete this pair. So what happens is we've only got carbon and fluorine in this container. That's what we mean when we say we're combining carbon and fluorine. We only have carbon and fluorine in the container. So carbon can join with carbon, but let's say that happens to join with fluorine at the moment. So what's gonna happen is there will be a fluorine here and it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I know I didn't draw that correctly, but I've shown you how it draws there. Okay, but do you see there's a space here and a space here and a space here? So what happens is we end up with a fluorine here and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and there it shares with that. And similarly, we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so do you see we have four shared, shared pairs of electrons here? Four shared, oopsie, yeah, I forgot one. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, I forgot one. Let's just fix that. Got one. Yeah, fluorine. One two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got four shared pairs of electrons. Let's try again. Four shared pairs of electrons, okay? And they're all covalently bonded. So that there, that there, that there, and that there are covalently bonded. And that is what's happening. And this is called, it's written as CF4, and it's called carbon tetrafluoride.
Okay, let's think about that. Carbon makes sense because the main element is actually carbon. The other element is fluoride, okay, because as soon as fluorine spits up into an fluoride atom, I mean, a fluorine atom, it's called fluoride when it joins into something else. Similarly with chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they become chloride, bromide, iodide, okay? And the tetra stands for? Four, not quad in this case, tetra. So we're saying that there are four fluorides for every one carbon. So there you go. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about the properties of covalent bonds. So the melting and boiling points of covalent bonds are smaller than those of ionic compounds. Okay, and that makes sense in a way because the covalent bonds are less strongly held together. Covalent bonds are more flexible than ionic compounds. What we mean by that is the molecules, the covalent bonds are able to move around to some extent. For example, graphite. Now, I know that you guys think of this as pencil lead, but in fact, as most of you do know, most of the pencil lead these days is actually not lead, but it is made out of graphite. And it's so smooth because of the fact that the molecules in the covalent bond can actually slide around each other, okay? So that is an example. Covalent bond compounds are not very soluble in water. They're not very soluble in water. And for example, your plastics. Most of your plastics are made up of, well, I'd say almost all I can't think of one plastic. Okay, I can't think of one plastic that's not covalently bonded. Okay, um, but because they're not soluble in water, they also do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Okay, because in order for something to dis conduct electricity, it needs to have ions. Okay, you need to understand something very important. For an element or whatever, for a compound, to conduct electricity, electricity in water, it has to dissolve and form ions because it's the ions that conduct the electricity. There are no electrons in the water, okay? It's ions, okay? And that is very, very important. You guys need to know that from now onwards, okay? That the, when electricity is transferred through a liquid, it is not because of electrons, it's because of ions, okay? And because covalent compounds don't dissolve in water, there are no ions. So therefore, the electricity cannot be conducted. And even if they do dissolve in, in water, they're so, they don't form ions, okay? So therefore, they do not conduct electricity. Okay, so next up we're going to start on ionic bonding, but I look at the clock and I see that it's almost the end of the lesson. So I'm actually going to call it for the day. Um, what I'd like to suggest you do is that you watch this video again. If you missed anything, you're welcome to go and click on exactly the same link that you watched this video on originally, and you will get to exactly the same video um, and then you can watch it again and you can pause it at certain sections or whatever or like I said join the grade 10 science class it's anonymous okay I'm not going to be checking whether you attend all the lessons or not it's just so that you guys can ask questions or send requests for information or for certain sections to be covered right I hope you have a great day and I will be doing grade 10 science again on Tuesday next week have a good Good weekend. Cheers.